could have ever guessed that a little piece of plastic would revolutionize the way the world did business, but that's exactly what happened when credit cards made their debut in the 1950s, and the Mafia, always looking for an easy buck, quickly realized the money-making potential those little plastic cards could bring to their coffers. But how did they make money off them? Let's find out. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Mob Fireside Chat. At Mob Fireside Chat, we bring to life select stories from the pages of Button Guys of the New York Mafia website, the only place you need to go to learn about real Mafia history. So go check out Button Guys today at www.thenewyorkmafia.com. Subscribe today and you'll be automatically entered to win 100 bucks cold hard cash. We'll pick the winner on March 31st. And don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and be sure to comment below after you watch today's video. Now, let's get on with our story about one of the mob's many lucrative money-making rackets, the credit card racket. Starting by at least the mid-1960s, the underworld in general, and the New York, New Jersey Mafia in particular, started realizing the tremendous money-making potential in the newly invented and quickly developing business model of credit cards. The idea of now being able to purchase goods and services on credit by simply presenting a rectangular plastic credit card was revolutionary. The general public could now buy clothes, shoes, furniture, airline tickets, and more. And even services such as moving, landscaping, and home construction projects could now be paid for with plastic. Needless to say, the credit card industry completely revolutionized how the world worked, thought, and functioned. Enter Cosa Nostra. Over the next 40 plus years, credit card thefts, the counterfeiting of credit cards, and other various types of card schemes using card account numbers would bring in untold billions of dollars to the mob's coffers. By the late 1960s to early 1970s, the New York underworld was in full swing with the racket. What had started slowly as an occasional theft here and there of a credit card sitting in a consumer's mailbox would eventually morph into the steady operation of semi-independent theft crews who went out daily and pilfered mailboxes to gain access to this plastic gold. They would then often fence the cards to organize hoodlums and connected guys for quick bucks, maybe $50 to $100 per stolen card. Mobbed up hoods would then acquire backup ID such as a New York State driver's license or social security card and go about busting out these cards for all they were worth at area department stores, restaurants, nightclubs, and basically anywhere the cards were accepted. And they made sure to squeeze the cards like lemons, extracting every dollar to their maximum credit limits. Being the enterprising hoodlums they were, local mafiosi and their mob associates often got the inside track to acquire these cards in bulk. Oftentimes, back in their boyhood neighborhoods like Bensonhurst, Red Hook, Williamsburg, and East Harlem, to name a few, the local mailman on their neighborhood route was a kid they grew up with. Better still, sometimes the guys working in the back rooms of the local neighborhood U.S. post office sorting the mail was an old buddy. Or he was the brother, cousin, or friend of a buddy Bingo! These postal workers would cherry-pick the mail and swipe certain envelopes that they knew contained new credit cards en route to consumers. It was a perfect scheme, because between the time the credit card company would mail out the cards to the time the customer actually physically received the card in his mailbox would oftentimes exceed a week or two. During that gap of time, while John Q. Public awaited his new credit card, mob guys were already using his card without his knowledge. And because the customer didn't know the date his new credit card was actually shipped, he had no way of knowing that he should have received it already, so he never picked up the phone to call the credit card company to let them know he didn't receive his card yet. And the credit card company was in the dark as well, thinking all was fine. When a store owner or vendor would run the stolen card through the credit card machine at his business, the charges were naturally accepted as a legitimate purchase. So, the business owner got paid for his goods, and the mob guy got the use of the card and thousands of dollars in free stuff. It was only weeks later when the consumer received his first credit card bill that he would call the credit card company to complain about the phony charges. That's when both he and the credit card company learned of the fraud on his account. The cardholders are exonerated from paying fraudulent charges on their card. The consumer would just receive a new card to start his account. Everybody was happy, except the credit card companies, of course. 
Another extremely profitable angle of the credit card rackets was to just counterfeit the cards themselves. After many years of having their cards stolen, the companies attempted many different types of methods to combat this growing problem. They were sustaining multi-million dollar losses annually, so something had to be done to stem the thefts. And what's that old adage? Necessity is the mother of invention? No truer statement has ever been made, especially when it comes to the scheming capabilities of Cosa Nostra and racketeers. Forget about robbing mailboxes, friendly mailmen grabbing the cars from mail sacks, or even having hookers along Broadway and 42nd Street in Manhattan swipe them out of the pockets of unsuspecting Johns as they turn nightly tricks. The mob soon decided to go into the credit card business for themselves, wholesale no less. Mobbed up burglary crews as well as insiders who worked at credit card companies who were indebted to the mob soon started targeting the actual laminating machines and sheets of plastic used to manufacture the cards, along with computerized lists of all pertinent data such as customer names, addresses, credit card account numbers, lines of credit, dates of birth, etc. Mafiosi were soon in business for themselves. This facet of the racket was to bring in untold wealth to the five families. Every mob family was involved in credit card rackets. It was just way too profitable a scheme for them not to be. But some crime families were into the racket deeper than others. By far, members and associates of the Joseph Colombo family were among the most prolific and successful credit card racketeers in the entire city. Here's just a very small sampling of a few names you might be familiar with who had their hands in the credit card rackets. The infamous Colombo soldier and decades-long FBI informer Gregory Scarpa Sr. specialized in credit card rackets for years. Scarpa was well known for heading a crew of hoods who both stole and counterfeited cards. At one point in time, Scarpa actually acquired a laminating machine used to actually create the credit cards. He became one of the biggest credit card racketeers in Brooklyn. Of course, his cozy relationship with the feds helped indemnify him from arrest. Scarpa was actually once charged with criminal possession of a credit card, but of course the case was later washed out. Another avid credit card racketeer for the Colombo family was an Astoria, Queens-based Colombo hood named Vincent Popeye Tortora, who was a member of Capo Carmine the Snake Persico's crew at the time. Totora became one of the leading figures in a years-long, multi-million dollar stolen credit card ring that obtained thousands of new cards directly from local Queens post offices through rogue postal employees. He was later indicted and convicted as the kingpin of the ring. Totora, who was a known loan shark and strong arm, received three years in federal prison for his exploits. Persico himself was one of the top capos in the Colombo mob, and his crew members were known to be among the most prolific credit card fraudsters in the city. Between 1965 and 1972, authorities tracked the arrests of many members of his regime for fraudulent use of credit cards for millions of dollars in losses to banks and other lending institutions. Over in the Gambino family, the infamous Carmine the Dr. Lombardozzi, a top Gambino family capo, and one of the most notorious racketeers in the city, also headed a crew who trafficked in credit cards. Quickly recognizing the potential profits available, and well known for their white-collar type racket schemes, Lombardozzi's men organized rings to infiltrate post offices, card companies, airlines, and restaurants where they could steal large quantities of cards. And there were so many others involved in this racket in every crime family, as mentioned earlier. And we hate to do this to you, but this is just a small snippet of the comprehensive article we've written on this particular racket, which you can find at our Button Guys website, plus extensive articles and numerous other money-making mob rackets as well. So go check it out. But as far as the credit card racket today, what was once one of the most enjoyable racket activities for mob guys is no more. It's ancient history. Modern technology and advanced law enforcement techniques have implemented protective measures against most credit card fraud. It destroyed what was once a very lucrative and quick money racket for the underworld, but such is life in the life. And that's the end of this racket story, at least here on Mob Fireside Chat. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and be sure to visit thenewyorkmafia.com to read more about how the mob made its money in the racket section of the website. Thank you for watching. Until next time.